Well, dear friends, as you heard, it is the Feast of Christ the King, and so it seems like a good occasion to ask, how do you know that someone is a king or a queen? Whatever you may have seen in cartoons or movies, they don't go around wearing a crown all the time. These days, you probably know it best because they have so much security around them, you can't get anywhere close. But in reality, what does make a king or a queen? How would we know who anybody was in the past who was? I think very often, the best thing we have is to see what signature projects they did, what it was they built or started or said or wrote that they intended to express fully the, the, the glory of their, their position and hopefully to be remembered at some point in the future. You can think of things like the pyramids that the pharaohs of Egypt built or Versailles that was built by Louis XIV or something that's not quite a building but has the same idea like the beginning of the, the English Navy uh, that could probably be said to happen sometime around the reign of Elizabeth I of England. But then again, there, there are others that are even less tangible than that. There really are ideas. And it's one of those that I want to tell you a story about this morning. In the year 269 BC, a man named Ashok became king of what was called the Mauryan Empire. It covered what is now most of central and northern India, parts of Pakistan, parts of Afghanistan, parts of Nepal, a very, very large area, much of which had been put together by conquest. His ancestors had gone on wars and, and, and brought more territory into what it was that they controlled. And Ashok began doing the same thing himself. He began to have military campaigns to conquer his neighbors and bring more territory into what it was that he controlled. But the story is told that eight years into his reign, he went on one of these campaigns and was so appalled by the loss of life, he said there were hundreds of thousands of people who were killed, that he was changed inwardly in some way by this experience. He converted to Buddhism and began to become kind of a philosopher king, to think through what it means to be a nonviolent person, what it means to live peaceably in community with other people, what it means to live peaceably with animals as humans, all these things that come up when you begin to imagine what, what a Buddhist worldview would be. And because he was a king, he wanted everybody else to know what he thought too, of course. So he began to write these things down. They were called edicts, there's rules to live by, standards for society, whatever you want to call them. Uh, things that dealt with how we live together as people and how we live our life communally in the world. And so that other people could know these things, he had them carved onto rocks and to pillars that were then put up around India. And you can still see them. They're, they're still there with Ashok's sayings on them. I mean, one is so, uh, could be interpreted to mean that he believed that he had conquered so much territory and he could declare an end to war as an instrument of state policy. So he was pretty ambitious with this. He wanted everyone to know what it was that he thought a kingdom should be. And so it was that he was able to do that and that we are still able to go and, and read to this day. Now today on the Feast of Christ the King, it doesn't seem like it's much of a stretch to say that Jesus is God's pillar in the world. You can read in the Law and the Prophets a lot of what you need to know in order to live a righteous life with God and with other people. But in the life of Jesus, in the ministry of Jesus, it all comes together in one person. It's all there for us to see what it means to live a righteous life personally, what it means to live a sacrificial life, to make choices for the kingdom of God rather than for yourself what it means to gather around you a circle of other people who feel similarly, what it means to speak up for those who don't seem to have a voice of their own, what it means to offer gentle and sometimes not so gentle criticism to others who don't seem to be following in the ways that God would lead them. All these things come together in the person of Jesus. And right down to this day, 2,000 years later, the pillar of God still stands in the midst of the world, there for anyone who go, cares to go and to read it. Now, that would be a good place to say amen and sit down. It's only been four minutes, so you know I'm not finished yet. 
because it always gets a little more complicated, doesn't it? Turns out that in the 2,000 years since, God has put down an awful lot more pillars in the world. Every Christian community, every Christian person is God's pillar in the world. Every one of us, every church and every Christian is meant to have carved into us the messages that the world is supposed to see about the intentions of God. There I could get, again, I could say amen and sit down, but we have to do the hard work first of asking how well have we done with that, dear friends. If we look at Christian history for 2,000 years, if we look around us today, we find that there are plenty of Christian communities and even Christian people who are not doing particularly well with this. In some cases, the letters have, have worn off the stone, whether from inattention or fearfulness or complacency, whatever it may be, from trying too many times and failing too many times, the stone is still there, but there's no message. In other cases, the letters are there, but they become so filled up with the dust and grit and dirt of life that they can't be seen or read anymore. This may be those cases where we're fearful, we're worried about trying anything new, we're afraid that if we try anything, we'll fail, or we like what we have already, so why bother doing anything else? In some cases, the words are still there, they're still carved, you can still read them, but nobody has any idea what they mean. Sometimes Christians say the words, we may even believe the words that we're supposed to say, but we never really take them into our hearts. And if they're not in our hearts, who's going to have any idea what we're talking about? So, what kind of pillar are we? Are we a good pillar? Are we a visible pillar? Are the words still legible? Are we living what it is that we say we believe? And is that not the way that we proclaim to the world those messages that God intends to be inscribed on us? How well are we doing at saying the kingdom of God is alive? How good are we doing at saying that the love of God is active? How good are we doing at saying that absolutely everyone is called into that work? And that if anyone fails to hear that message, it is not through God's trying, but rather through ours. You may know that this last Sunday of the church year, which this is, the new year of the church begins on the first Sunday of Advent, is kind of our New Year's Eve. This is kind of our last Sunday before we begin the next cycle of everything. Not a bad time to make New Year's resolutions to look back and be very grateful for everything that we have had and everything we have done this year. And then to think about how we can build on that, how we can expand, how we can deepen, how we can carve those letters of the message of God even more deeply into ourselves as we begin the next year. A number of us were at the convention of the diocese the last two days. And we have been re-immersed in the priorities of the diocese, the ones the bishop has set out for us as things he would like all the churches in the diocese to be working on and the diocese as a unit to be working on. I think those are a good way of thinking about what we have done and where we might go from here. I've talked to you about this before. I'm sure you have inscribed on your memories exactly what these things are, but just in case there's any wandering stranger who doesn't know what I'm talking about, the three main priorities are growth, discipleship, and service. I'm taking those in a different order, I think the first one we might, we might think about is, is discipleship, by which we mean learning. This takes us right back to whether we have taken into our hearts those things that we claim to have learned. Far too many adult Christians learned everything they thought they needed to know in Sunday school. They've been trying to run with that ever since. The truth is, there is much that we learn as we go through our lives. There's excitement in the things that we learn. How well are we doing with that? 
Well, this year we've had great success, it seems, with bringing in electronic resources and bringing in Bible study and mixing them up together and sending them out into the world. I hope we'll continue that. I hope we'll have more podcast Bible study in the next year. I hope we'll find new ways to learn together, new ways that will energize us and and involve more people. I hope you'll join me in doing that work. There's so much that we have been given in the way of resources, so many clever people, so many people who have so much to teach. It's only at our peril that we refuse to take advantage of all of those many opportunities. Then growth. That's a nice, polite word, because it sounds like it's, it's something involving, you know, adding more people or adding more money or something like that. But those of us who went to the growth workshop yesterday learned that hiding beneath the word growth is the word evangelism. We sat in groups yesterday and did hard but really good work in talking to one another about what Jesus has meant in our lives, where we have had deep spiritual experiences, where we've seen wonder in the world, where we have seen that the action of God in our own lives and the lives of other people. And by the end, we were almost ready to start testifying to each other. The diocese is making this program that was developed by one of the seminaries of the Episcopal Church available to every parish for free. I challenge us to do it next year, to gather over a course of several weeks to learn how it is that we pull those things that are already inside us out, how we look at them, how we think about them, how we talk about them, how it is that what's in our heart needs to be on our sleeve, and how we then take that out into the world to everyone else we meet. Growth, dear friends, will mean inner growth first before it means anything else. And then service. Service is our mission and our outreach, the things we do for the world, the things we do for one another here, everything we do that flows out of the love of God that can't be contained in us. Yesterday at the convention, Father Clay and I did presentations about two programs that are in their infant stages yet here. One is ecumenical campus ministry, the next phase of our ministry to higher education, and the other is the Nuri Project, our work with local students to gain useful, marketable skills through internships here at St. Thomas's. I am pleased to tell you the diocese thought enough of these two programs that they gave us some money to do them with. What the world, how the world says something is worth doing, it puts its money behind it. Those programs, as I say, are just in their infant stages. There's already energy growing behind them. I hope that continues. I hope it grows. We cannot allow ourselves to be held back by any amount of fear, any amount of doubt, any amount of we've never done that before, we don't know how to do that, we don't know where the money's going to come from, we don't understand what it's going to do, we don't understand how it works. None of that can stop us. Can I get an amen? Amen. Thank you. The bishop does that a lot. I picked it up this weekend. (laughs) These are the ways that we carve onto ourselves the messages God intends the world to see. That there is life flowing out of this place. That there is life growing up in this place. That the love and compassion and mercy and healing that God intends for the world will begin here and will flow out from here because that is God's will. Are you ready, dear friends, to have that carved on you? Are you ready to have those letters carved into you so deeply that no one can fail to see them? That no one can fail to understand who you are and whose you are, who we are and whose we are? That, dear friends, is our resolution as we begin the new year. Christ the King has gone before us. There is nothing that we cannot accomplish if we will only say yes.
So let us be one more piece of what it is God is doing in the world, an important piece, the only piece that's happening right here in this place. Let's give thanks as always to Christ the King who leads us, guides us, holds us up, and in all things blesses us. Amen. Amen. Amen.